Now, the label Pipe Music, was that your own label? Pipe Music was another strange story. Um, Pipe Music was started by Gary Peart, who was Robbie's younger brother and who was the manager of the band at the time. Okay. And um, I, the, 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 the name Chalice come from me, right? I gave the band that name. I had to convince them because um, what it meant to me was this. In, in the Catholic Church, the, the chalice is that cup that represents the blood of Christ. and It's a communion. Everybody sips from that cup. And in the Rastafarian doctrine, the chalice, everybody smoke. You pass the chalice, right? So I just thought that our chalice could be filled with music and we could, we could make the world our community and share the world with our music as a, as a communion. And so pipe music kind of, the logo was like, our logo was like this Christian, this old chalice you know, um, with, 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 a, with a hose coming from it with, and smoke coming out the top. So it was natural that when we decided to form a company that all of us would be shareholders was called Pipe Music and that the label would also be called Pipe Music. Um, so, so it was a company that we were all shareholders in. But but um, if I was to tell you the whole story about pipe music, it would probably take two days. So we leave that for now. What can you tell me about Trevor Roper? One of the most brilliant sang uh, singers I've, I've ever known. He was natural, a natural singer. I met Trevor um, when... I was also I was also dabbling in a in a four man singing group called Time in between Byron Lee and and uh, Hells Angels and Byron Lee, and we we did Baba and they produced a couple of songs with us as a four man singing group, and somebody dropped out and then another member of that group said he knew this guy who could sing and he invited Trevor to, to join. We didn't really do anything with Trevor, but I was so impressed with his voice. And not only that, I found out that he was a very skilled guitar player as well. So when we were looking for members to complete Chalice, right away I thought of him. And um, I mean, Trevor's voice was like by, I don't know, I, the band, you see, unfortunately, here's what happened. I think we came at the wrong time for, for what we were doing. If, if you listen to that Blasted album, you'll find that there are four lead singers. There's me, there's Trevor, there's Robbie, and a keyboard player, Mikey. We all sang lead on one song or the other. And in trying to get a deal now, we, we like Island Records because the engineer of our first three albums was Stephen Stanley. So, so Steve was a personal friend of ours and he mixed those albums for us. And he presented them to Chris Blackwell who flatly turned it down. And the reason for Chris turning it down was the band had no identity because on the record, we had a song called Funny Kind of Reggae, which was almost funk. We had a song called I Still Love You, which was a ballad. We had some lovers rock and we had some hardcore, like Good To Be There. And so, the, so at the time, the biggest bands, apart from the Wailers, were Steel Pulse with David Hines as the lead man, it was Third World with Bonnie Ruggs as the lead. So they had a, a sound and an identity. Our albums are sounding like a collection of songs. Okay. You know what I mean? So, I, I mean, if, if those albums were to come out, no, it would, it, it would be accepted. It wouldn't be any big deal. But back in 1980, you know, it, it's very stereotypical how people pigeonhole you in, in, into something. Because, as I say, the record companies were looking for those bands with, I guess, one unique sound. So, um, if we had vision, maybe 
we would make either Rabbi or Trevor sing everything. And then maybe we would have had a, a unique sound, but it didn't work out that way. And we bucked the system because we did the second album <laughs> the very same way. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, what it did was argue well for our live shows because you didn't just have one voice um, going through hour and a half set. You know, anything could happen. That's the beauty about Chalice at any time. We, we were into costuming, we were into um, um, theatrics. Robert Peart used to perform with some glasses that has his eye bulging out. And and, and um, when we did Old Nega, we were all dressed in rags. And then at the end of the song, we would have, have on a, a, a three-piece suit. <laughs> so it was, uh, when I did I Still Love You, I used to perform it in my pajamas with a pillow, hugging up a pillow. It was a, a ballad <laughs> about last love. So we had to make an impact in, in Jamaica real quick. And the fact that the ballad was our first hit song that stayed for 14 weeks as number one on the legitimate charts back then. Right. Um, yeah, w did it. And then Good To Be There was our second um, hit song in two years. So, I mean, we, we took off fairly rapidly in Jamaica. And we never started touring until two years after the band was formed. We um, came to America for the first time in 82. And we went to Europe for the first time in 84, which was, which was to me, our European stint was really great because in America we play mostly for the diaspora, but in Europe we're just playing. If it's Germany, we're playing for Germans. France, we're playing for France, for French. And, and you know, that gave us so much confidence because of the reaction. Actually, the first time we ever toured in Europe, the first show we ever did was quite a story, if you don't mind. I just try and keep it short. We were in a, we were in a club on the Leopoldstrasse, <laughs> and it held about 150 people, small club. And the, the dressing room was right next to the stage. And so uh, we went and we did our sound check, got everything right. We, we had our lighting engineer, our sound engineer, our road crew with us. It was a big, big thing for a group not making any money, but we didn't. It was one of those things that you have a family and nobody left behind, right? So we had this thing where we would take the stage in darkness and then we would roll, Desi would roll and the band would kick off and the lights would come up and there we would be. And, and we, we hear the people coming into the club, we can hear them and the show is about to start and the lights go down and it's darkness and we hear the crowd very excited and and the MC, who's the club owner, goes on stage and introduces Charlie's from Trenchtown, Jamaica, because it don't matter at the time. As long as you're reggae, you're from Trenchtown, right? <laughs> <laughs> so there's your role and the band. And you, you, when the lights come up, you just hear the, the crowd go, oh, you hear the disappointment. Because on stage, for a band named Charlie's from Trenchtown, Jamaica, there was not one dreadlocks in the bar. Oh. It was seven ballhead man, right? And we got the shock of our lives when we saw 150 blonde dreadlocks in the audience with them, them khaki clothes and them red, green, and gold tam and all that. It was like, wow. Anyway, the beauty about it is that we got held over at that club for three more nights because of the reaction and they had to be turning our people and we had to come back to Munich four weeks time to sell out a 2,500 seater place and Chalice was on a roll I mean we were off and running and we got all the press because first of all as as people who um we could interact and when the press come to ask you questions, they wanted to sit with us for the whole day because as one journalist told me, he sat with a very famous group who, who was 
um, who was really kind of taking the scene after Bob died. And he said he sat with him for three hours and he couldn't write six sentences because it's like, you know, he says, so can you explain to me about Rastafari? Well, you know, you don't know Rast a Rast, you just have to sight and I just Rast. And when you sight Rast, I just saw it going on. That was that was the essence of the conversation. So when we could explain ourselves and our culture and then grasp it, I mean, the thought we were, wow, breath of fresh air. And we went back the following year and did all the festivals, all the festivals with the biggest of groups. And we, we, we toured it down. I'm telling you, we toured the place down. But once again, management just kind of uh, that took away that dream from us. And after 1987, we did not go back to Europe until, after 87, we did not go back to Europe until 97. But um, I must say that we were the very first band ever to take a reggae to Istanbul, Turkey. And that was one of the greatest experiences of my life. I wanted to talk about the song Children in Exile. Right, Desi Roots actually wrote that song, but I added some some lines to it. I added some of the verses, um, but but it was actually Desi Roots. His it was his song. Okay. And he 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 came to us and said we should cover it because he just liked the sound what Chalice was doing at the time, and we were happy to cover it because it was a great song. Still is a great song. Mm -hmm. So that surprised me because it sounds like a childish song. <laughs> well, you know, people say that childish have the sound. I mean, I've I've done stuff for other people, and they said, "Oh, that sound like childish." And I like like for instance, um, I I wrote and produced um, "Righteous Youth" for Richard Spice. And and everybody tells me, oh, it's, that sounds like a Charlie song. Well, I guess we have a song then. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about Reggae Sunsplash because Chalice was, they were like staples of Reggae Sunsplash. Well, um, Reggae Sunsplash actually started before Chalice. I think they started in 78. Um, and of course, as a as a young band coming up, you have to aspire. I mean, if you don't do sunsplash in in your country as a reggae band, you're not doing anything. You know? um, the first time we did sunsplash, I think, was 1981. But the the, the big one for us was 82, because it was Chalice and Yellow Man who were really really the the, the standouts of that that gig and we we always happened to to do I remember one one sun splash it was I can't remember the year but we we didn't have any hits or anything fresh to bring to the people other than performance and I remember seeing Muta Baruka on that show for the first time and Muta was outstanding to me and I was fretting I said boy you know he was what we're gonna get the people now then but here's the thing. We were scheduled to go on at like three o'clock in the morning, which is really the deadest hour. It's, it's the hour when the people just start to flag. They have seen some of the top headliners and and it happens that some of the acts went on so long that we didn't take the stage until 5.30, almost six o'clock in the morning. But you see, when we took the stage at six o'clock, that was when the people just start wake up. And when them wake up, man, and them, and Chalice was on the stage, them just decided to party with Chalice. We got some great press, not doing anything new, but just doing the hits. And, and the people were just getting up and in a mood now to just shake off the weariness and party. So it, it was just the right time in, in the bright morning sunshine. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a good memory for me too, uh, for our Sun Splash history. And they actually <clears throat> took um, a track from it and made one of the soundtrack records, but I didn't keep I didn't keep track of it to, to even know what happened with that record. 
the 82 one was released as an album. Yeah. That was the first time I, I remember hearing or actually seeing Chalice. It was an old VHS tape. <laughs> Reggae Sunsplash 82 and you did um, Rebel Music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> that was our bass player, key to suggest he would do that. Uh, and it, it became... Uh, it became a part of our set for a long time. And I remember because you said, yeah, you said the first one you played, the first Sun Splash you played was 81. And you said, well, I see why we say Montego Bay don't change. Because last year when we leave Reggae Sun Splash and I head back to the hotel, the same thing happened this year last night. Three o'clock, road black. <laughs> <laughs> you're, a, you're a very observant. <laughs> Let's talk about the song Revival Time. Um, my bass player is very innovative, very innovative bass player. And he would just create some bass lines and bring the bass line alone to me and say, write some songs for this. So we have songs like Dangerous Disturbances. We have songs like um, I'm Only Human, which wasn't really that big, but I like it. And he brought this unusual bass line to me. Be do be do beep, be do be do beep. And I said, whoa. Anyway, I wrote, it, it was like, it was like late 80s and the AIDS epidemic was, was, was rocking at the world, right? And I thought I would write something about this AIDS epidemic on this song. So I did something like that. And I, when I took it back to him, he said, no, I don't want that on my bass line. I don't want nothing like that. Come again, he said, come again. So I go back and I listen to it and it actually sound happy. It didn't sound like something that really should have taken a serious um, uh, ly lyrical stance. So. I thought about that bass line for a long time. And then I remembered a song, you see, when I was young. And I don't remember, I don't remember who the group did it, who the group that did it. It was an American R&B group. And it was a song called Testify. And the lyrics to that song said, I just want to testify what your love has done for me. And I said, whoa, testify. Testify, how can I put this in a song? And then I kept saying, raise your hand and let us testify. And I said, no, no, no. Raise your hand if you want to be sanctified. I said, yeah, that's all right. All right. Sanctify. So I know where we're going with it now. We're going to the, 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 the Bible belt. We're going to, to gospel with semi-gospel, as close as we can get without being hardcore gospel. And then the first line popped into my head about baptism. And it's always in Jamaica, and, you know, you, you gather at the river and the person dip you in the river and you get baptized. So the first line comes, children, children, run to the river. And then it just started to flow. And when I took it back to Keith, Keith said, yes, this is it. This is it. So we went into the studio and Keith made everybody, told everybody what he wanted them to play. He wanted this drum pattern, he wanted, and it worked, it worked, I think. But we, we went to do a video for it, and when we actually went to the river to do the video, a group of people from the, 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 the township around, the, around the, the, where the river was, they came out, and them started to do this strange dance, like wheeling up, boom, boom, boom. And it became a thing. And in the Christmas of that year, man, the whole part, the whole season, it, revival time was like the biggest thing ever. We did some concerts in, in Jamaica because of that song, that unforgettable. And it, it's like, it's the first time in Chalice history, and we were what, eight or nine years, that I see people actually get, 
you want to say, in the spirit, them just get mesmerized by the song. You, you couldn't sit down in the audience. You could not sit down. And it was just great. It was great for us. And then um, Lloyd Love in there, who is a, a man who does parodies of everything, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he, did, he did a song called, instead of raise your hand if you want to be sanctified, he did a song called, raise your hand and show me your panty size. <laughs> Which also kind of did well for him. Mm -hmm. And then and then a few years after that he came to me and he said, You guys not you guys not doing any more song like revival. And I said, No, we did it. We've been there, done that, you know, kind of thing. And he said, Well, I have a song that I, I will bring it to you. And he brought the song called Pokomania Day. And believe you me, boy, we could not refuse to do that song. And he produced, he wrote it, produced it, and collaborated with us. And it was another big hit. Another big hit. I, I don't think it it left the shores of Jamaica much. It was big in the diaspora and big in Jamaica and in the Caribbean. Yeah. But I, but I don't think um, foreign audience would probably would relate it. I, I've ne we have never done it on tour unless there's a huge Caribbean um, uh, out, uh, outpour of Caribbean people. But but when we perform like straight up Americans or Europeans, we're never brave enough to try that song to say how it would go over. But maybe there'll still be a chance to do it. When Lovendeer was talking about this song, he said it was, it, it became like the unofficial festival song of 89. Right, right. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for telling me it was 89. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. Um, because the, 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 the festival songs were poor. There was not a, a good selection. So people just, from, from the time independence to Christmas, it, that song was ruled. Ooh. 